like to introduce my co-chair who will give us our first talk, Professor Sanjay Sharma, who is a, a, the, has been the cry cardiologist for a number of years now, and he's one of the medical directors for a number of sporting bodies in the United Kingdom, and obviously has left his mark in the international field of sports cardiology. And the subject he's going to discuss is athlete's heart versus dilated cardiomyopathy, what's the role of exercise imaging, which is a very novel topic. Thank you very much, Professor Sharma. Thank you very much, uh, Michael, and good morning, everyone. I'll be discussing methods of differentiating physiological increases in heart size from dilated cardiomyopathy. There is a lot of data about how we do this with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, but data relating to dilated cardiomyopathy are lacking. We know that people who exercise intensively for more than four hours per week do develop an increase in cardiac size to generate a long and sustained increase in cardiac output. In general, athletes develop a 10 to 20% increase in left ventricular wall thickness a 10% increase in left ventricular and right ventricular cavity size, and a 45% increase in left ventricular mass. However, the magnitude to which these adaptations develop is governed by several factors, including age, sex, ethnicity, size of the athlete, the type of sport, and the intensity of sport. So over to my first question, this is poll one. Approximately what percentage of adult male athletes have a left ventricular cavity size exceeding predicted upper limits for the general population? Is it A, 10%, B, 50%, or C, 60%? Okay, okay. let's go let's down. Go. Uh, sorry. sorry. Let's go to the end of the screen and let's try and vote. So the great majority, Professor Sharma, have only 10%. Okay. Actually, it's still okay. Yeah, so 62% have gone for 10%. About 29% okay. uh, have gone for 50%. And only 10% have gone for 60%. So the majority says 10%, with 50% being the second most popular answer. Okay, well, let's take you to a seminal study. The answer is 50%. Let's take you to a seminal study that explains this. This is the largest study conducted of its type in Italian Olympiad athletes and included about a 1,000 athletes. You will see that there are female athletes and male athletes. The females are in the red bars and the males are in the blue bars. The first thing to note is that the blue bars exceed the red bars in terms of dimension. So males get bigger dimensions than females. The second important point is that 48% of athletes in this cohort had a left ventricular cavity size of over 54 millimeters. And even more importantly for this talk, 14% of athletes, predominantly male, had a left ventricular cavity size exceeding 60 millimeters. And that that's the sort of size that would be compatible with a diagnosis of dilated cardiomyopathy. Now, the type of individual that develops these types of dimensions are usually adult males with a large body surface area that engage in endurance sports such as long distance running, cycling, triathlon, rowing or canoeing. So these are the sort of people that get very large dimensions. We rarely see dimensions exceeding 60 millimeters in adolescent individuals or female athletes. And in some cases, the baseline left ventricular ejection fraction is slightly depressed because these individuals have a very large stroke volume and therefore they don't have to move their hearts very much to generate a baseline cardiac output of five liters per minute. Here is data from 286 Tour de France cyclists. In this cohort, over 50% had a left ventricular cavity size exceeding 60 millimeters and around 12% had a left ventricular ejection fraction of between 48 
and 52%. Clearly, when you see a very big heart with a borderline low ejection fraction, this does raise the possibility of dilated cardiomyopathy and the differentiation between physiological cardiac enlargement and dilated cardiomyopathy is essential. So here are the two entities, and what they share in common is an enlarged left ventricle and reduced left ventricular ejection fraction. Clearly, if you diagnose dilated cardiomyopathy, the athlete is advised to refrain from intensive exercise. They are commenced on therapy to improve prognosis. They undergo risk stratification with view to implanting a defibrillator. And we are questioning them about first degree relatives and assessing those individuals. In contrast, physiological cardiac enlargement is considered benign. It regresses with detraining. It has no impact on prognosis and doesn't have any effect on the aspiration of the athlete to compete. And you can see that an erroneous diagnosis in such situations can be quite serious. So the objectives of the rest of my talk is to provide methods of differentiating between athletes with an enlarged left ventricle and a slightly low left ventricular ejection fraction and asymptomatic and highly active individuals with early or mild dilated cardiomyopathy. Most of the data I'm going to present has come from our group uh, study uh, published by Lynn Miller, uh, and this is how it was. Active individuals with left ventricular enlargement. We took 25 athletes with a borderline low left ventricular ejection fraction, 24 athletes with normal left ventricular ejection fraction, and 35 individuals with dilated cardiomyopathy who exercised frequently and were in NYHA functional class. And you'll see that all of these individuals are in their fourth decade. All of them underwent ECG, BNP assessment. Apart from the echocardiogram, we looked at the indices of diastolic and contemporary markers of systolic function. They underwent exercise echo, halter monitoring, and cardiovascular magnetic resonance imaging scan. As far as individuals with dilated cardiomyopathy go, 15 had familial dilated cardiomyopathy, 13 had idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy, three had dilated cardiomyopathy due to anthracycline therapy in the past, and four had recovered from myocarditis but were left with an impaired ejection fraction. So next poll, poll two. Which of the following ECG patterns differentiate physiological left ventricular enlargement with a borderline low left ventricular ejection fraction and highly active individuals with dilated cardiomyopathy? Is it A, left axis deviation, B, left bundle branch block, or C, voltage criterion for left ventricular hypertrophy? Over to you to vote now. Okay, let's start voting again. <clears throat> so you've got about 10 to 15 seconds to vote. People are voting, which is very good, and we're interacting. <laughs> That's very good. Uh, lots of both votes coming in. Initially, it seemed that the left bundle branch block <laughs> with the left axis were almost neck to neck. But I think now yeah, so what we've got is we've got uh, about 70% for left bundle branch block. 20% for left axis deviation, and only 10% for voltage criterion for left ventricular hypertrophy. Okay, thank you. Well, the right answer is left bundle branch block. So the role of the ECG, the, the overlap between athletes and those with dilated cardiomyopathy include voltage criterion for left ventricular hypertrophy, voltage criterion for left atrial enlargement, and left axis deviation. The things that separated them out was left bundle branch block, ST segment depression, pathological Q waves as defined as a, uh, defined as a QR ratio of more than 0.25, D-wave inversion in the lateral leads, and ventricular extrasystoles on the ECG. In this study, 
40% of highly active and asymptomatic patients with dilated cardiomyopathy had an abnormal ECG, only 40%. This included five with T-wave inversion, four with left bundle branch block, four with more than one ventricular extrasystole, two with pathological Q waves, two with ST segment and two with ST segment depression. I should point out that 95% of individuals with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy have an abnormal ECG. Around 70 to 80% of individuals with ARVC have an abnormal ECG. But our finding was that when, it look, when we look at highly active individuals with DCM, only 40% have an ECG that we would consider abnormal for an athlete. What about the role of brain natriuretic peptide? We know that brain natriuretic peptide is released in individuals with heart failure or dilated cardiomyopathy due to myocardial stretch. We do see raised BNP levels in athletes, but that's usually after a grueling exercise, and this usually becomes normal within 48 hours. So all these individuals all had BNP levels 48 hours after intensive exercise. None of the athletes had an elevated BNP. In contrast, around 30% of highly active and asymptomatic patients with dilated cardiomyopathy had an abnormal BNP level of more than 125 picograms per mil. Per mil. What about the role of halter monitoring? Only one third of athletes with dilated cardiomyopathy had an abnormal halter compared with none of the athletes. And by this, I mean, these athletes had either more than 500 ventricular extrasystoles in five cases, non-sustained ventricular tachycardia in two cases, and a combination of more than 500 ventricular extrasystoles and non-sustained ventricular tachycardia in three cases. So poll three, which of the following echocardiographic markers is the most useful for identifying an individual with dilated cardiomyopathy? This is an active individual with dilated cardiomyopathy. A, left ventricular cavity size of 62 millimeters, B, global longitudinal strain of more than minus 17%. C, an inability to, to, an inability to increase left ventricular ejection fraction by more than 11% during exercise. Over to you to vote. Wonderful. So let's start voting again. Is it a matter of left ventricular cavity size? Does global longitudinal play, strain play an important role? Or is it simply the fact that they cannot increase the rejection fraction during exercise. I think the more, two most popular answers for the time being, Professor Sharma is uh, the inability to increase the ejection fraction and the left ventricular cavity size. I don't think many people believe on the strength of the global longitudinal strain for the time being. Okay. But let's, so is, let, 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 let's give them a bit more time to finalize the vote. It's very encouraging that a lot of people are voting, so we've got up to 55 votes now. We should be close to 100, guys, so please, please keep voting. Okay, so we've got an ability to increase the left ventricular ejection fraction with overwhelming majority of 84%, left ventricular cavity size only 12%, and the global longitudinal strain, I'm afraid, only 4%. Okay, let's talk you through this and see what the right answer is. So here is an echocardiogram of a top premiership football player. And uh, you will see that uh, we've got, you've got sort of four images here, four views, parasitic long axis, short axis, uh, four chamber views. And you will see that this athlete's got an LV cavity size of 62 millimeters, just the sort of thing we're talking about with an ejection fraction of 52%. The lateral E prime is 14.3 centimeters per second, and the S wave is 9.6 uh, centimeters per second. So let's look at the indices of longitudinal systolic function and diastolic function as markers of DCM. The normal values that we use here are a lateral S of more than nine centimeters per second or a lateral E of more than 14 centimeters per second. If you look at these variables, they've got a sensitivity of between 60 and 70%. So if we use this, you will get 
false negatives uh, in 30 to 14 percent of individuals. So that's not very good. So they don't perform very, very well in individuals with dilated cardiomyopathy who are very active. So these individuals often have normal natural S and natural E primes. Let's look at global longitudinal strain. This is baseline values. So you can see that athletes have a greater uh, baseline global longitudinal strain compared with DCM. And we used a global longitudinal strain of more than minus 17% as normal. We found that 68% of our athletes had a low baseline global longitudinal strain. And we found that baseline global longitudinal strain values were unhelpful in differentiating between athlete's heart and dilated cardiomyopathy. So let's turn our attention to exercise echocardiography. On the left, you see resting values, and on the right, you see values uh, after during exercise. And you can see that the ventricle appears to have woken up. But the big question is, how much should the ejection fraction change? Should it be 4%, 6%, 8%? Where's the cutoff? So here is the role of increase in the left ventricular ejection fraction from baseline to peak in our healthy athletes with a dilated left ventricle and a borderline low ejection fraction, our healthy athletes with normal LV function and our DCM patients. If we draw a line to a change in left ventricular ejection fraction of 11% or more, then we found that 24 out of 25 athletes, that's 96%, could increase LV ejection fraction above 11%, compared with only eight out of 35 patients, that's 23% uh, with dilated cardiomyopathy. And this had a sensitivity of 77% and a specificity of 94% to predict dilated cardiomyopathy. What about peak left ventricular ejection fraction? Again, same box plots. If we draw a line at 63%, then 92% of our gray zone athletes, that is athletes with an LV, a dilated LV with a borderline low ejection fraction, could achieve a peak left ventricular ejection fraction of more than 63% versus only 17% of individuals with dilated cardiomyopathy. And this had a sensitivity of 83% and a specificity of 92%. If we combined a change in left ventricular ejection fraction above 11% and the ability, ability to increase LV uh, ejection fraction by 63% or more. This had a sensitivity of 86% and a specificity of 92% to differentiate between the two entities. So the answer to your question is the inability to increase LV ejection fraction by 11% or more is the best marker of these three of differentiating between physiological cardiac enlargement and dilated cardiomyopathy. A group from Europe and Australia showed similar findings with exercise cardiovascular magnetic resonance imaging. They used a small cohort of 10 ath endurance athletes, nine individual dilated cardiomyopathy, and five athletes who had uh, mid-wall fibrosis. And they also found in this very small study that a left ventricular ejection fraction of 11% or more differentiated between physiological cardiac enlargement and individuals with dilated cardiomyopathy and athletes with myocardial fibrosis. What about cardiopulmonary exercise stress testing? We know that peak oxygen consumption is a product of cardiac output and the systemic arteriovenous oxygen difference, but it's predominantly governed by cardiac output. Now, athletes have large stroke volumes and therefore they generate very large cardiac outputs. In this study, 71% of active patients with dilated cardiomyopathy actually had a normal peak oxygen consumption. 20% achieved a peak oxygen consumption of more than 120% of that predicted for age and size. And some of these individuals with dilated cardiomyopathy achieved values as high as 56 mils per minute per kilogram. But this group were exercising quite intensively for around nine hours per week. So I think peak oxygen consumption may not be as useful as we once believed, particularly in individuals with dilated cardiomyopathy who do have the functional capacity to exercise intensively. But what we did find during the exercise stress test was that individuals with dilated cardiomyopathy frequently showed complex ventricular arrhythmias or polymorphic ventricular arrhythmias, such as shown on this exercise stress test. MRI scanning is considered the gold standard now for making the diagnosis of dilated cardiomyopathy. Apart from showing an enlarged left ventricle, it does show mid-wall scarring as well and gives you a very good idea of ejection fraction. So this would be the gold standard. 
But in our cohort, only 50% of our individuals with dilated cardiomyopathy actually had mid-wall scarring. So based on all of our findings, we, we're, I'm, demonst- I'm showing you this chart now with all the investigations where on the right, you've got how these investigations are truly positive for identifying dilated cardiomyopathy. And on the left, how these investigations are truly negative to exclude pathology. And you will see that conventional find markers that we use, such as ECG and BNP, are positive in only 30 to 40 percent of individuals with dilated cardiomyopathy who lead a very active life. And whole to monitoring is only abnormal in around the third. MRI scanning is only positive in 50 percent. However, the modality that seems to perform best is exercise echocardiography. So if we were going to draw a practical algorithm based on the data so far, then the sort of thing that favors pathology is a BNP level of more than 125, an ECG showing left bundle branch block, frequent ventricular extrasystoles, T-wave inversion or ST segment depression, a Holter monitor showing more than 500 ventricular extrasystoles or non-sustained ventricular tachycardia, an exercise echo showing an inability to increase left ventricular ejection fraction by 11% or achieving a peak left ventricular ejection fraction of more than 63% and the presence of mid-wall late gadolinium enhancement on an MRI scan. So in conclusion, the combination of ECG, BNP, 24 hours ECG and CMR would fail to diagnose more than 30% of trained individuals with dilated cardiomyopathy and a mildly reduced left ventricular ejection fraction. Stress echo has a better diagnostic ability. The inability to increase LV ejection fraction by more than 11% or increase peak LV ejection fraction by more than 63% has has a more than 80% sensitivity and more than 90% specificity for DCM. Combining these two stress echo parameters reduce false negatives to 14.2% and false positives to 8%. Thank you very much for your attention. Wonderful. Thank you very much for your lecture. lecture. Uh, without any further delay, and I'm sorry for the echo, I would like to introduce